Welcome to this, the 162nd episode of the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show on August 24th, 2023. My name is Andy Z. I'm the host of the show, coming to you from Los Angeles, California. This is a show precisely about and for what our name says Revolution, nothing less. In today's RNL Revolution Nothing Less show, we are going to get right into the heart of the system that dominates the world today capitalism, imperialism, and why only an actual revolution can free humanity from this system that threatens humanity's very existence. And today we're going to be showing the premiere of a special video presentation created by the RNL team of an article by Baba Vakian, Exploitation, what it is and how to put an end to it. Last week in RNL episode 161, we dug into what an actual revolution is and how it could really be made. If you didn't catch it last week, watch it now. There's never been anything like this. If you did see it, watch it again for a strategy for how to actually make a revolution in a powerful country like this is a tremendous breakthrough. And it's developed by Baba Vakian, a revolutionary leader like no other that has existed in this country. Baba Vakian, who comes out of the revolutionary movements of the 1960s, has over decades developed a whole new framework for the emancipation of humanity, a way for the masses of people to know and change the world to overcome all forms of oppression and exploitation that not only torment people today, but threaten the very survival of life on this planet. Later in today's show, we're going to play the beginning of the interview we did on this show with Bob Avakian. It's a lot of fun. It's funny. And you get to see how not only Bob Avakian became the person and the leader he is today, but how each of us and all of us can change. There is a strategy for actually making a revolution. There is leadership for that revolution. And there is a whole other way we could be living. This is what the revolution is for. A whole different way of living is possible. A whole different way to organize society with a radically different economic foundation and political system, emancipating relations among the people, and an uplifting culture. All of this oriented to meeting the basic needs and fulfilling the highest interests of the masses of people. This is from a declaration that the Revcoms and this show are aiming to get in front of and in the hands of hundreds of thousands and then millions of people. A declaration that expresses a great need and a demand for a new society based on the Constitution for a new socialist republic in North America. A constitution written by Baba Vakian. As one key and foundational part of preparing for revolution, we are getting this declaration out and into people's hands along with a broadsheet, a proclamation titled, We Are the Revcoms, the Revolutionary Communists, that puts forth that because the rulers of this country are so deeply divided that there's no coming together between them on the normal, yes, highly oppressive way that this country has been ruled for over 150 years. Just think about the fascist Republican Party's attempted coup leading up to and on January 6, 2021, and the enormous unbridgeable divide from the highest offices of the government right down to local school boards. The proclamation we are the Revcom says starkly, quote, shaping up before us now are two fundamentally opposed futures, something terrible or something truly emancipating. And because of this situation, we, the Revcoms, are determined to seize on this rare time to develop the basis to actually make revolution, to finally defeat the enforcers of this monstrous system, and to abolish this system with all of its oppressive institutions and its governing U.S. Constitution, a document written by and fundamentally serving the interests of slave-owning and capitalist exploiters from the founding of this country right down to today. And all this is in order to establish a far better system based on the Constitution for the new Socialist Republic in North America, written by Baba Vakian, which provides a sweeping vision, a firm foundation, and a concrete blueprint for bringing into being a society and ultimately a world free from all forms of slavery, all exploitation and oppression based on class, race, sex, and gender all relations in which one part of humanity is subordinated to and dominated by others, 
this socialist system, in uprooting the capitalist imperialist system in this country, and supporting revolutionary struggle in the world as a whole, will create a realistic possibility and will move systematically and effectively to address the already acute and fast accelerating environmental crisis, while also moving to abolish nuclear weapons, with the ultimate goal of finally abolishing wars among human beings with the abolition of the capitalist imperialist system and all systems and all relations of exploitation and oppression, which are the basis for wars. For all this to happen requires you and now. We invite you to be a part of getting these two proclamations out everywhere with the Revcoms over Labor Day weekend and to spread this show, the RNL show, and to especially watch and let others know about the Bob Avakian interviews on the RNL show. We're going to have more to say about all of this later in today's show. We are on a mission this year to put revolution on the map in this country. Also, after we watch the first question and answer from the interviews with Bob Avakian, Sansara Taylor, the co-host of the RNL show, will join us to introduce a part of the program that Rafael Caderas, a regular contributor to this show, did at Revolution Books in New York City this month on woke lunacy versus real revolution. So let's go now to the premiere of the video on exploitation, what it is, and how to put an end to it based on an article by Bob Avakian. Exploitation. What it is, how to put an end to it. By Bob Avakian. In a recent report about revolutionary work in Chicago, one of the people there drawn to the revolution indicated that he did not know what the word exploitation means, because this word exploitation describes something very basic about the system of capitalism that we are now forced to live under, and because many people do not have a clear understanding of this, it is important to explain what is meant by exploitation. In the most general sense, to exploit means to take advantage. More specifically, it can mean taking advantage of using other people. And in terms of a scientific understanding with regard to the economy, exploitation refers to a situation where one person or a group of people accumulates capitalist wealth that is created by the labor of others. Capitalism is a system in which a relatively small number of people, the capitalists, own and control the major means of production, factories, land, raw materials, machinery and other technology, and so on and are therefore in a position to force other people who do not own or control means of production to work for them. It is the labor of those exploited by the capitalists and not the brilliance or entrepreneurial genius of the capitalists that actually creates the wealth that the capitalists appropriate take for their own profit and use. Once again, the capitalists are in a position to appropriate wealth that is produced by others whom they exploit because the capitalists own and control the major means of production. Means of production which themselves were created through the labor of people exploited by capitalists. For example, in a capitalist-owned factory, the machinery that people work on was produced by people in other factories working on raw materials to create that machinery. And those raw materials in turn were mined by people also working under conditions of capitalist exploitation.
Under the capitalist system, there is always a surplus population. People who are unemployed because they cannot be profitably exploited. And the existence of people in this position is something which the capitalists take advantage of in exploiting those they do employ. If you don't want this job at the wage I'm paying you, there are plenty of other people out there who are desperate for work. Today, this system of capitalism has developed into a highly globalized system of exploitation, capitalism imperialism, in which a relatively small number of capitalists own and control means of production on a massive scale and appropriate huge amounts of capitalist wealth. On the basis of exploiting billions of people throughout the world, including hundreds of millions of women, and more than 150 million children who are most viciously exploited, super exploited, especially in the third world, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. Once again, these billions of people are in a position where they can be viciously exploited because they do not own means of production. Many of them, particularly in third world countries, are people whose families previously owned small parcels of land on which they farmed. But they have been forced off the land, no longer able to survive by farming. This is a tremendous problem because according to the UN, about 735 million people faced hunger last year. Now that breaks down to nearly 10% of the world's population. And these numbers are even higher when you factor in those who lack adequate or healthy food. That number accounts for nearly 30% of humanity. In large part because of the domination of the politics and the economy of their countries by capitalists centered in imperialist countries like the US. It is this system of capitalism imperialism that is the root cause of all of the horrendous, unnecessary suffering and madness that people throughout the world are subjected to. And the growing threat to the very existence of human beings as a whole. To get rid of exploitation and all the oppression that goes along with it, it is necessary to get rid of the system of capitalism imperialism. And that means making revolution to overthrow this system and replacing it with a fundamentally different and far better system based on the constitution for the new socialist republic in North America. What this revolution and this radically new system are all about, why this revolution is possible, and how to carry out this revolution. All this is made clear in a number of works of mine and others at Revcom.us, including the proclamation, We Are the Revcoms, and the declaration from the Revcoms, We need and we demand a whole new way to live, a fundamentally different system, as well as the constitution for the new socialist republic in North America. This is also brought alive on the YouTube RNL Revolution Nothing Less show. And here's the challenge. Everyone who can't stand this world the way it is, who is sick and tired of so many people being treated as less than human, who knows that the claim of liberty and justice for all is a cruel lie. who is righteously enraged that injustice and inequality go on and on and on, despite false promises and honeyed words from people in power or those seeking power. Everyone who agonizes about where things are headed and the fact that to be young now means being denied a decent future or any future at all. Everyone who has ever dreamed about something much better or even wondered whether that is possible. Everyone who hungers for a world without oppression, 
exploitation, poverty, and destruction of the environment. Everyone who has the heart to fight for something that is really worth fighting for, you need to be part of this revolution. Especially at a time like this, a time when big things are up in the world, affecting the whole future of humanity, when those big-time exploiters and oppressors who rule over us in this country are bitterly divided among themselves and increasingly unable to hold things together as a unified ruling class. When there is not just an urgent need, but a real possibility to seize on this situation to overthrow them altogether. If you are not getting with the REFCOMs, revolutionary communists, who are working every day for this revolution, if you are not part of working to bring about this revolution, then what the hell are you doing? Bob Avakian included three substantive footnotes throughout this article, which deepen our understanding of materialism. Footnote number one, on the bitter effects of exploitation. The bitter effects of being part of the exploited class, the proletariat, under the capitalist system, is something people experience in their everyday life. In the book, The New Communism, I spoke to this. Quote, You may be at the bottom of society. Either you have no job and you're scuffling the way you can. Or you get a job and somebody exploits you. And to get that job, you have to go and sell yourself. That's what you do. You go in for a job interview and they say, well, now let's get into your history and all that. Sometimes they want you to piss in a bottle. And sometimes they want to know everything about your personal history. They want to know if you've ever been arrested. Or do you have a felony conviction? So you left college before you finished? Yes. Why? I got a felony conviction. And you can't say, what the fuck? Just give me the job, goddammit. I'm hungry. You're out the door. You can't even more politely say, excuse me, but that's kind of a personal question, don't you think? No. Because the person interviewing you is working for the people who own the means of production, and you don't own any. So you're in a powerless position, because if you don't satisfy them, they don't hire you. As for the foundation of the capitalist system, this was built up with a lot of violence. For example, in Europe, several centuries ago, large numbers of peasants, small-scale farmers, were driven off their land and forced into the position of proletarians, having to sell their labor power, their ability to work, to capitalists developing in the cities on the basis of their role as merchants, as the heads of early manufacturing associations, as moneylenders. In the Americas, huge numbers of the original inhabitants, who had managed to survive the wars and disease brought by European invaders, were forced to labor, often under literally life-stealing conditions, to enrich exploiters who came to the Americas from Spain and other countries. And let us not forget, the foundation for the wealth of this capitalist country, the good old USA, was, to a very large extent, based on slave labor. As Karl Marx, the founder of communism, pointed out, with biting irony, the rosy dawn of capitalism was marked by the enslavement of massive numbers of Africans. literally working to death, conquered people in South America, forced to mine precious metals, and other monstrous means of accumulating wealth. It is a fact that some of the earlier societies in the Americas, such as the Inca Empire in South America and the Aztecs in Mexico, were themselves based on exploitation of masses of people by the ruling classes in those societies, 
and it is true that there was slavery within Africa itself for some time before the invasion of that continent by European exploiters. But all this took on much greater and more horrific dimensions beginning several centuries ago with the conquest and colonization of these continents. The development of the international slave trade and the relentless machinery of capitalist exploitation. capitalist exploitation, through which generation after generation of people, in the millions and millions, have been ruthlessly used up and killed off, quickly or more slowly. In the manic capitalist quest and merciless competition among capitalists, for profit and more profit. There has been another horrific incident at a garment factory in Bangladesh. Over a thousand people died when an illegally extended eight-story building, uh, uh, which was a garment factory, collapsed in an instant. Uh, they made clothes mainly for Western fashion brands. I was hearing the scream from the rubble. Someone saying, chop off my leg and pull me out. Footnote number two, on the other capitalist exploiters. Besides those who are directly involved in exploiting people in the process of producing the wealth of the capitalist system, there are also other capitalist exploiters. For example, there are the banks and other financial institutions that make profit through loans to the corporations and other businesses that directly exploit people. These loans have to be repaid with an additional amount of money, the interest. Plus, often these financial institutions themselves invest in the corporations that are directly exploiting people. And in turn, large-scale corporations also become involved in financial transactions. Finance capital becomes woven together with capital directly used to exploit people in the process of production. There are also merchant capitalists. For example, those who sell clothing or food and other basic necessities. And then there are those who invest in the stock market. But that just amounts to a kind of gambling. Betting on which capitalist enterprises will be more successful in exploiting people. Here is the most fundamental point. The source of the wealth that these different capitalists accumulate is the exploitation of people who are forced to work for one or another capitalist or capitalist corporation in the process of producing the things that people use. Footnote number three on why this is a time when revolution could be made. Why this is a rare time when revolution, even in a powerful imperialist country like the U.S., becomes more possible is examined in a number of works of mine and others at revcom.us, including Revolution, Major Turning Points and Rare Opportunities, as well as Something Terrible or Something Truly Emancipating, Profound Crises, Deepening Divisions, The Looming Possibility of Civil War, and The Revolution That Is Urgently Needed a necessary foundation, a basic roadmap 
for this revolution and organizing for an actual revolution, seven key points. And again, this is also brought alive on the YouTube RNL Revolution Nothing Less Show. We want to go back to the conclusion of Baba Vikian's article, Exploitation, What It Is, How to Put an End to It. B.A. writes, quote, Everyone who can't stand this world the way it is, who is sick and tired of so many people being treated as less than human, who knows that the claim of liberty and justice for all is a cruel lie. Who is righteously enraged that injustice and inequality go on and on and on. Despite false promises and honeyed words from people in power or those seeking power, everyone who agonizes about where things are headed and the fact that to be young now means being denied a decent future or any future at all, everyone who has ever dreamed about something much better or even wonder whether that is possible. Everyone who hungers for a world without oppression, exploitation, poverty, and destruction of the environment. Everyone who has the heart to fight for something that is really worth fighting for, you need to be part of this revolution. Especially at a time like this, a time when big things are up in the world, affecting the whole future of humanity when those big-time exploiters and oppressors who rule over us in this country are bitterly divided among themselves and increasingly unable to hold things together as a unified ruling class. When there is not just an urgent need, but a real possibility to seize on this situation, to overthrow them altogether. If you are not getting with the Revcoms, revolutionary communists, who are working every day for this revolution. If you are not part of working to bring about this revolution, then what the hell are you doing? So that was Bob Avakian's piece that you can find on Revcom, Exploitation, What It Is and How We Can Put an End to It. Um, it's a, as I said at the beginning of the show, exploitation is at the heart of the capitalist imperialist system. But take note of how he ended that piece, where he said, if you are not part of working to bring about this revolution, then what the hell are you doing? Now, I am here with Sansara Taylor, the co-host of the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show. Welcome to this episode 162, Sansara. Very happy to be here. All right. So what do we got next? Well, uh, we're going to go now to the opening portion of the interviews that we did with Bob Avakian here on this channel last fall, the three-part major interviews, Up Close and Personal. And I think in this, uh, what we just watched on exploitation, you get a sense of one of the rare qualities of Bob Avakian of really developing theory on a world-class level, really penetrating science, and at the same time being able to break that down and make it very understandable, very accessible to a very broad audience. Um, and you get to know B.A. In, in all 360 degrees going through these interviews that we did with him. And you get the science, you get who he is as a person, how he developed, you get the, the vision of the new society that he's forged, and these interviews need to be seen 
by millions and millions of people throughout society right now. It's going to change what people are thinking about, what they're dreaming for, what they're aspiring to, what they do with their lives, what they're debating at this crucial time when, when the future is being determined. So these interviews, we're going to show you a portion, but they're a very, very big deal. Yeah, you know, it's really unique to have somebody who can who has developed theory on the level in which he has. You know, we talk all the time on the RNL show about the new communism and how it's, on the one hand, uh, coming on the basis of and upholding the essential uh, scientific contribution of Marx and the first socialist revolutions, first in the Soviet Union, uh, up and through the 1950s, and then in China up to the mid 70s uh, after Mao died. But Baba Viking has gone. Is, is, is not only taking the key lessons from uh, those revolutions, but he's gone beyond it to develop the new communists. But how rare it is to have somebody with that kind of theoretical ability who yet has such a visceral feel for, for, for the masses of the most oppressed, but also for all of humanity. And so we were trying to figure out what, what we're going to do on, this, on, on today's show. We thought the very first question that you asked Bob Avakian is, how did he become who he is today? Was he always this way? Was a, a, a fitting way to begin. As I said earlier, um, not only do you learn about uh, his development, which he tells you the story of, and, and get a sense of his character, but also in seeing how, how he went from a, a patriotic uh, American to uh, the foremost revolutionary communist leader uh, in, in the world, in that, you can see for yourself the, the capacity that, that each of us has uh, to change. So let's just go right to uh, playing this first answer to the question that you posed to him at the start of our interview with Bob Avakian. So the first question we wanted to ask you um, takes off from a spoken word piece that you wrote a number of years ago, an incredible spoken word piece called All Played Out. And I want to read the second verse and ask you about it. You write... This puffed up stuff about the land of the free. This puffed up stuff about the land of the free and the home of the brave. A country that builds itself on bodies of slaves and ruthless genocidal robbery that spreads its empire through plunder, driving countless people under with its bloody red, white, and rag unfurl. All this pompous nonsense about the leader of the free world. That's all the way out. A country that built itself on bodies of slaves and ruthless genocidal robbery that spreads its empire through plunder, driving countless people under with its bloody red, white, and blue rag unfurled. All this pompous nonsense about the leader of the free world. That's all played out. So we wanted to ask and give you a chance to talk about, did you always have this view of America? And if not, how did you first come to see this country in this way and its role in the world? Oh, 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 oh no. I, mean, I, I was a very loyal American. You know, I think I said in my memoir that one time I said I felt like getting down on my knees and thanking God that I was born in this great country, unlike all these other unfortunate people all around the world who were... Uh, you know, forced to live in other countries. And I remember uh, when I was 16, I think, I went to a baseball game, a Giants baseball game in San Francisco, and of course they play the national anthem before, and so, you know, everybody rose, and I got up, and I enthusiastically was singing, you know, oh, say, can you see, et cetera, et cetera. And when it finished, the woman in front of me turned around and said, my, you have a beautiful voice. And, and I just couldn't, can't help thinking back about the irony of that, you know. But then, as I did learn things, I used to go to the games and, and uh, you know, this was during the Vietnam War, when they would play the national anthem, I did a different version that someone I knew was part of the movement that I was part of, made up, which was, Oh, Uncle Sam, get out of Vietnam. Get out, get out, get out of Vietnam. So that was a different <laughs> rendition of the song and didn't get quite the same response <laughs> from the people in front of me. But, you know, that, that was a transformation I went through. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of different things. I, I you know, grew up in Berkeley. Uh, I was very fortunate to go to a high school. There was only one high school in the, in the entire city. So everybody, of course, went to it. And in those days, there weren't as many, there weren't all these Christian fundamentalist schools. There were a few Catholic schools, but mostly everybody went to the high school, the public high school. 
And so you were thrown together with all these people, you know, Latinos, you know, there were a lot of black people, and you know, some of whom I had known from being in sports competition earlier. And then we got put together, and because I was playing football, I was in gym class with a, with a lot of uh, people who were on the football team who had come from the different middle schools or junior high schools where they were mainly black people. And so this was like, introduced me to a whole different side of, of America. And you know, I had a lot of experiences. Some of them are funny to look back on, <laughs> but they weren't particularly funny at the time. You know, they were kind of hair raising, but you know, this was starting me on a different path of, of learning about what this country is really all about. So that was the start of it. I have to ask, funny and hair raising. Maybe you could give an example. <laughs> well, you know, when I was, uh, in 10th grade, this high school was only three years at that time, 10th grade, 11th, and 12th. So when I was in 10th grade, I was in gym class. And uh, our, at, at that particular time, our, our instruction, so to, so to speak, was swimming. And so I was you know, just standing by the pool, hanging out. And there was this friend of mine, Langston Tabor, who uh, you know, had come from a different junior high. But then we, and we had some friction when we played sports in junior high. But then we became friends. In, in high school, and he was kind of hanging out behind me. And I'm just minding my own business, and all of a sudden this big dude comes up and he's just looming over me. And he looks at me and he says, are you Bob Avakian? And I said, yeah. And he said, did you go to Garfield? That's the junior high I went to, which was almost all white. And I said, yeah. And he said, did you play basketball? And I said, yeah. He said, did you play against Burbank? That's where he went. I said, yeah. And I'm trying to figure out what the hell's going on here. And he said, did you foul me? <laughs> and then I had a sense something big was up, you know? And so, but you know, I was kind of naive. So I just kind of straightforwardly said, well, I might have, I can't remember something like that. And then he looked at me and he got this big grin across his face. And I, I thought it might've lasted like a minute or two, probably only lasted about 15 seconds. And then he finally just kind of turned and slowly walked away. And after this was over, Langston came running up to me and he, 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 he said, man, you don't know what just happened here. He said, that's Jack McRae. He's one of the baddest dudes in the whole school. And I said, what are you talking about, man? He said, you know, he said, he was getting ready to fire on you. He was gonna punch you out. I said, come on, man, he was smiling. And he laughed and he said, yeah. But when he gets that smile on his face, that's when he's gonna unload on somebody. But I guess what happened was Jack just kind of looked at it and said, oh man, this white boy, he just kind of doesn't, doesn't get it, so I'm just gonna let him slide. So that was kind of a, you know, a, a thing that made an impression on me, shall we say. You know, it, it, it started me thinking about a bunch of stuff because you realized that this wasn't really just about you know, the basketball game. There was a lot of tension in that game. In fact, they nearly stopped the game because we had broke out near, fights were just about ready to break out every few minutes. But it was, this was much more like people testing you. You know, like see where, you know, where are you coming from? What kind of person are you? you know, how are you gonna respond when they, when they put it to you a little bit? You know, because these things were going on that were much bigger than me and Jack McRae. There, this was the whole time when the civil rights movement was gaining momentum. And, and it also translated into, into personal relations and, and just you know, everyday social relations where you know, people, especially black people, just weren't putting up with shit the way they had before. You know, and f they were feeling the strength of, of the you know, gathering movement. And so this was, like, this was sort of a, an expression of that even though it was in a sort of a personal realm. And so you know, these are the kind of experiences that I had a, a number of times in high school that kind of, you know, opened me up to more things, should I say. The other thing that you uh, cited and you sang was get out of Vietnam. Yeah. Um, how did that play into your changing view on America? Well, you see, here's where things are interconnected. Like, as a result of these experiences, I made a lot of friends of different kinds. You know, I, I ate lunch one semester with uh, some Japanese girls who were, you know, very sharp and smart, but also, you know, a lot of fun. So I learned something about their culture, you know. Um, and then, you know, just going through high school and everything, I really began as a result of black friends of mine, you know, to get a much better, deeper sense 
of what it was like to be black in this country and the whole history of it. I mean, you know, not that they gave me history lessons, but just, you know, everyday exchanges of friends, you know. I began, and I really d developed a deep anger and hatred about this. And I remember the turning point for me about Vietnam came in, in, the, in 1965 when there was a march, you know, from Selma. And uh, I got up in the morning and I got the newspaper and it opened up and there's this big article about this attack on these civil rights marchers, you know, on the Pettus Bridge. And I was going back and forth about Vietnam. I'd been part of the free speech movement in Berkeley and most of the leaders, if not all of them, of that movement were against the Vietnam War. But I hadn't made up my mind yet. I was very, I respected them a lot. I was influenced by them, but I hadn't really, I was doing some study to try to understand it, but I hadn't made up my mind. And I opened up the paper that day and I looked at it and these pictures of Selma and I said to myself, how in the fuck can the rulers of this country be trying to bring freedom to the people in Vietnam when this is what goes on in this country time after time? And, you know, yes, it's in the South, but the leaders of the country as a whole are doing nothing to stop this. How in the hell can they be bringing freedom to the people in Vietnam? And that was it for me. From then on, I was firmly opposed to the Vietnam War. <laughs> We turn now to the national speaking tour and campaign that I have been spearheading, along with Rafael Caderas, a regular contributor to this show, called Woke Lunacy versus Real Revolution. Now, why are we doing this campaign? Well, Rafael broke this down well in the speech that he gave last week at Revolution Books up in Harlem, New York City. He brought alive the intensifying climate destruction that we are facing having just lived through the hottest month recorded in 120,000 years, as well as the growing threat of nuclear war between the U.S. gangster imperialists and their rivals in Russia and China. And he dug into the rise of fascism in this country and how none of this can be solved under this system. What is urgently needed, and right now what is more possible, is a real revolution and a whole new system and a whole new way to live as envisioned in the Constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America. Yet, right now, at this very moment, as Raphael got into it. And right now, one of the biggest roadblocks, especially for young people who need to be a key part of this revolution, is woke identity politics. Think about everything I described about the moment we're living in. College campuses should be hotbeds of resistance and revolution. Students should be looking at the big picture, seeking out and debating root causes and real solutions. Instead, wokeness is shutting down questioning, lowering people's sights, and misdirecting their outrage in destructive, in destructive ways furthering the nightmare we face, a narcissistic obsession with self and identity, a focus on changing words rather than changing the world, and hiding from reality with safe spaces and trigger warnings, a cannibalistic cancel culture backed up by identity politics police dictating who has a right to speak and make art. And if you haven't experienced something directly, you should just shut up and stay in your lane Check your privilege, all aimed at getting a seat at the table in this blood-soaked American empire. And then through the course of his presentation, Raphael went deeply into the philosophical underpinnings of this woke identity politics. He went into its political bankruptcy and its anti-revolutionary program. And he brought alive how we need to be casting this off and struggling with others to cast it off and working now for a real revolution that can emancipate all of humanity. So we want to urge you to go and watch the full speech and Q&A that followed, which you can find at revcom.us or at revolutionbooksnyc.org. And even more, to go to revcom.us and find the extensive work that Bob Avakian has done on this question, which Raphael and I are basing ourselves on in taking up this tour and campaign. But today, on today's episode, we want to share a portion of the Q&A from the event that he did in New York City that touches on a crucial question about what is the nature of truth and how do we come to know it? Let's watch. I see one in the back and then we'll come to you in the front. 
I, I agree that, you know, the cancel culture is, is very toxic. But I think that as far as, um, you know, yes, there is, there is one objective reality, but, you know, e each individual person experiences that reality very differently, which I think uh, can impeach someone's ability to understand certain things. And I think that the, the further removed you are from certain types of oppression uh, in, in, in those situations, the harder it is for some people uh, to really empathize and, and actually understand um, what those oppressed communities are, are going through. And so in that way, we are living different. We're living different truths. You're talking about, when you're talking about bridge the gap, you're talking about like people with more privilege who may not understand certain things or may, yes. may not have experienced certain things? I, well, you know, affluenza, yes. Yeah, well, okay, first of all, I, I just, this is a good question. I just want to step back to what, what is truth because you went from people have different experiences, which is true. <laughs> we, we People do have all kind of, you know, they, they do have different experiences. Like when I... I'm in front of a cop and I stick my hands in my pockets. I don't have to worry the same way as a black person does about getting murdered, <laughs> you know, being seen as a threat in the same way, right? And, you know, I gave the example about what women have to go through just going for a jog in this fucking society. You know, I don't have to deal with that, right? But, the, you know, but then you went from that, the fact that people have different experiences to saying different truths. But truth, truth just means... Truth is a correct correspondence with reality. That's all truth means. It means it corresponds re to reality. And, you know, experiences are part of reality. But that's, that's something anyone can con come to understand. That's why it, it is actually important for people to, you know, he hear the stories and learn the experiences of other people. I mean, how do we bridge that gap? It means people have to learn what other people go through. It's, you know, people should actually learn about the migrants right now who are crossing the Darien Gap in Panama through the jungles, basically trying to, you know, get to the north, right? And, you know, they're on foot going through horrendous situations. P people are dying along the way. They're having to leave all their shit in the jungle in the mud because they can't carry it all. Little babies are going through, through this. They're getting sick. Some of them are dying. This is the, people have to learn about this. But then, you know, and it is part of coming to empathize with other people. I think that's really important. We have, to, we have to get out of a situation where people are just concerned about themselves and they're just concerned about their identity group, you know. And, they have to, and especially for people in America, <laughs> they have to start thinking about, you know, not just about Americans, but the people of the world. That's very important. But why are people having to go on that journey from the Darien Gap. You know, why are so many of them Venezuelan? What's going on in Venezuela? Do you know about the sanctions that the U.S. has put on the country of Venezuela, knowing that it's going to cause malnutrition for, like, millions of little children in that country, forcing parents to have to flee? You know, th this is the kind of thing that actually, it doesn't just come from experience. It comes from, like, actually an analysis of the situation this is what and this is the essential thing if you know if you're just trying to empathize with other people well you should just learn their experiences but if you actually want to stop this shit you have to learn what's the system behind it you know you have to actually dig down to the roots of it you know our, our friend over here mentioned intersectionality all right i think she talked about intersections right and different axes of oppression and you know intersectionality analyzes there's you know, racism, there's gender oppression, there's oppression based on sexuality, there's all these different axes of, axes of oppression. But what it doesn't get to is what's the actual underlying system that all this oppression is rooted in. It's a, it's a global system of capitalism, imperialism. You know, and this is, this is actually, how do you bridge that gap? You have to dig down to the roots of that system. Because not only is there a problem with people not understanding each other's experiences but as long as you have this capitalist imperialist system in place different groups will be pitted against each other different identity groups and some of that will be the conscious manipulation of the powers that be the way that they consciously pit, pit different groups against each other 
you know, but some of it is just everyone, you know, under capitalism, you just got to pursue your self-interest. You know, I, pe- people may know about there was Cherokee Indians, Native Americans who were Cherokee who owned slaves. And there were black people, <laughs> Buffalo soldiers celebrated in the Bob Marley song that went out west to slaughter Native Americans. You know, so this is how the system pits different oppressed groups against each other. It, you know, so we got to get to the root of that system. Now, that was just a taste of the very rich program with Rafael Caderas at uh, Revolution Books in New York City called Woke Lunacy versus Real Revolution. And again, we urge you to watch the full program at revolutionbooksnyc.org or at revcom.us and reach out to us wherever you are to connect with this tour, to bring us to speak on your campus or in your town, and to get involved in other ways. So we're going to close out today's show with two contributions, one from the Chicago Revolution Club and one from the L.A. Revolution Club. Uh, So uh, first, we're going to start with the Chicago Revolution Club. We were just uh, uh, really happy to receive this unsolicited. uh, Some of the people in the Chicago Club put together a, a short uh, video that uh, about revolution and about the Revolution Club and about the RNL show. So we want you to uh, watch this, and uh, I want to say we want to get more of these sent to us. This was really great to, to just to receive this uh, in, in an email, and uh, it was really a big thrill around here. How many of uh, you know rallies, protests, however you like to call it? How many have you organized so far?
As Andy mentioned at the opening of today's show, this country is sharply divided from the very top all the way down to the local school boards across this country. And this is true here in Los Angeles as much as anywhere. This past week, a march of about 150 fascists marched on the uh, central LA school district school board meeting um, with a whole lot of uh, anti-trans, anti-truthful uh, uh, history of this country and its white supremacy, a whole lot of fascist demands. What brings you out here? Take the children. What are they doing with the children? Molesting them basically, that's all they're doing. Who is uh, they when you talk about they? The LGBT community, they're all, they're all child molesters, all of them. You're teaching the kids all the bad, they're grooming the kids, and I just want them to teach something good, the goodness of the Lord, teach the Bible. Fortunately, here in L.A., they were counter-protested. Um, unfortunately, by a much smaller crowd, about 50 people came out and counter-protested them. including members of the Revolution Club here in Los Angeles. The police were out, unjustly, brutally attacked the counter-protesters, including assaulting and arresting a member of the Revolution Club here. Um, we're very happy to report that she has been released and she is in very good spirits. What we want to do now is give you just a snippet of the local news coverage and then share with you a TikTok that the Revolution Club put together. Downtown L.A. where dueling rallies are facing off. LGBTQ groups are countering parents' rights protesters in a heated exchange over school curriculum. We are here opposing this fascist white supremacist ticket right across from us. We are fighting on a national level to openly discriminate against LGBT people. I need to talk to you who saw that yesterday even here in liberal L.A. There was a regional gathering of fascists who have been part of attacking these LGBT rights and lives and a police assault on those who are opposing those fascists. When they say parents' rights, they are talking about the right to terrorize trans and LGBT kids. They see themselves as part of a new confederacy and they have been preparing for a one-sided civil war against everyone they hate. The way that this country has been held together, as terrible as it has been, cannot continue to hold it together. You need to become part of working with the RevComs now to wake people up to the potential for something truly terrible, even worse than what has already been a system of oppression and exploitation. You need to be working with the RevComs now to wake people up to what needs to and can be done about this, of letting people know that there is a force, a strategy, and a program and leadership for a real revolution a whole better way to live in a fundamentally different system. All right, Sansara, that brings us to the end of this, the 162nd episode of the RNL show. Um, there's a lot of important things that we got into in this show, and I think that very last TikTok uh, gives some sense of the serious situation that we're facing and the task of mobilizing masses of people to uh, not only resist the attacks on them by the government and by these fascist forces, but to prepare for revolution, including getting out the declaration and the proclamation that I spoke of at the beginning of the show and to really popularize the interviews, the first question of which we saw tonight. That's going to take an awful lot of money. Yeah, we want to talk very briefly before we close out the show about money. Um, recently, we had a major fund drive. Many of you participated, went out and raised money um, for the work of the RevComs. We really want to encourage that. Um, all the efforts you undertook, this needs to be ongoing. Spreading this revolution and building the, the donor base of this revolution for the work we're doing broadly, for the, all the posters and the broadsheets that are going to be getting out on Labor Day weekend, but also for the production of this show. Um, it costs a lot of money. And we need to continue to do this work and expand. So please, if you were out fundraising before, going door to door, uh, doing bake sales, spreading the word at farmers markets, please keep that up and involve more people. We need to spread this. And if you're not yet a Patreon, if you don't yet support this show monthly with your contribution, now's the time to start. And if you are a Patreon, find one other person that you convince to also become a Patreon and build the ongoing support network of this show. 
All right, so that's it for this 162nd episode of the RNL Show. We're going to see you next week at 5 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Central Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Thursday evening. 